Rogue Planets. Why the very name conjures up images of Star Wars battles and Jedi Knights. Look up rogue in the dictionary and the first definition is a dishonest or unprincipled person. The second definition is an elephant or other large wild animal driven away or living apart from the herd and having savage or destructive tendencies. No doubt you've heard the expression a rogue elephant. But what is a rogue planet? Well, until the first confirmed detection of exoplanets using the radial velocity method, we did not even have any scientific evidence for the existence of any planets outside our solar system. And then NASA's Kepler Space Telescope mission taught us that not only are there planets beyond our solar system, but planets are essentially everywhere. They're ubiquitous in our galaxy at the very least. We now know that statistically speaking, every star in the sky has one or more planets orbiting it. In the Milky Way galaxy, planets likely outnumber the stars, and there may be as many as tens of billions of rocky Earth-like planets that could potentially harbor life. The majority of exoplanets discovered thus far have one thing in common. They are all orbiting stars, their own suns. That fact is indeed central to how they were discovered in the first place. But what happens if a planet gets kicked out of the herd, if you will, and ejected from its solar system and goes rogue? And if an ocean world, for example, is ripped from the warm environment of its host star and drifts in the frigid depths of interstellar space, could it still hold on to a liquid ocean and maybe life beneath an icy crust? Could aquatic life forms on such a planet have any chance at survival? And if so, for how long? Is such a scenario even possible? Well, today we're gonna to explore that question and find out. We've invited two extraordinary young scientists to discuss the detection and characterization of rogue planets and their potential to harbor life. We have an associate professor from the University of Chicago with a background in physics and applied mathematics, and an astronomer and planetary scientist who is an assistant professor at Louisiana State University, and among other projects, looks for rogue planets using the gravitational microlensing technique. Our guests will be introduced by our moderator for today's discussion, our own Dr. Franck Marchis, who is an astronomer and senior scientist at the SETI Institute and the chief scientist for unistellar telescopes. So good morning, good day, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our July 2021 SETI Talks program. SETI Talks is the monthly lecture series produced by the SETI Institute in Mountain View, California. I'm Bill Diamond, the president and CEO. The SETI Institute is a nonprofit research and education institution whose mission is to lead humanity's quest to understand the origins and prevalence of life and intelligence in the universe and to share this knowledge to inspire and guide present and future generations. Our SETI talk series has been running for more than 10 years. And if you visit the archive on the Institute's website or YouTube channel, you'll discover hundreds of lectures, debates, and panel discussions featuring many of the world's foremost researchers, educators, and explorers in space science covering an extraordinary array of topics. Recent topics have included, is oxygen really a biosignature? Why is the earth still habitable? Going dark, the mystery of vanishing stars, and the search for life on Mars with the Perseverance rover. Over a year ago, the coronavirus compelled us to convert our SETI talk series to a virtual online program, but that's actually given us the opportunity to reach a truly global audience and make new friends. And we're delighted to have you with us all today. So whether you're joining in today on Zoom or Facebook, YouTube, or some other platform, we bid you welcome and thank you for joining us. As our regular attendees know, we really love to find out where you're watching from. So you're, if you're watching us on Zoom, use the chat function to give us your coordinates. Let us know where you are. And on Facebook, use the comment section and let's see how far we're reaching across our own planet today. And if you happen to be watching from a rogue planet somewhere, a very special welcome to you and please let us know your coordinates. We also like to poll the audience to find out who's joining us for the first time and who's a habitual fan. So if you're with us on Zoom, you'll see a pop-up menu on your screen where you can let us know. Select the answer that fits and hit submit and we'll share the results in just a few minutes. We'll have time for audience questions after the moderated discussion. So if you're watching via Zoom, post your questions using the Q&A feature you see at the bottom of your screen. My colleagues, Rebecca and Simon will be fielding your questions. We'll do our best to answer as many as we can, but please understand we can't get to all of them. Before we get started, I wanna make you aware of uh, some terrific upcoming events you might be interested in. We do have another uh, SETI talks coming up in August and I believe the, uh, the registration site will open up on August uh, 4th. So uh, please look to the website seti.org for more information about the next SETI talk and other upcoming events. 
And with that, I'd like to turn the podium over to my colleague, Frank, to get the conversation started, introduce our guests, and talk about rogue planets. Frank? Thank you, Bill. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for the 100 people watching us right now. So, um, yeah, I know you all want to talk, you all want to hear about those rogue planets. So my, I'm gonna give you a very short introduction of our speaker. Um, so let me first introduce um, Matthew, um, no, Dorian Abbott. Hello, Dorian, how are you? So Dorian, you can unmute yourself. Uh, you are um, uh, an assistant professor, associate professor at University of Chicago. Uh, you came there uh, after your PhD, which was uh, in applied math in 2008 in Harvard. And uh, you like Chicago because after, after going there as a Chamberlain fellow, you stay as a faculty member. And now you use the mathematical and computational models to understand and explain fundamental problems in earth and planetary sciences. So you've been working on a wide variety of problems, including climate evolution, bioclimate, cryosphere, habitability of planets and exoplanets. And today you are going to talk to us about uh, this idea of having life on rogue exoplanets. And the second speaker is Matthew Penny. Hi, Matthew, how are you? Hi, I'm good. Hi, so Matthew is an assistant professor at Louisiana State University. Uh, you, you have an astronomer who study uh, the population of planets who are the Milky Way uh, using large surveys and uh, gravitational microlensing. So we are going to talk about these techniques, of course, to detect, uh, to detect rogue exoplanets. You're the principal investigator as well for the MISHAPS survey, searching for hot Jupiter exoplanet near the center of the Milky Way. So you are an, an observer like me, and uh, you are going to tell us as well about the future of the search for rogue exoplanet using new facilities such as NASA Roman Telescope or the ESA Euclid missions as well. So, uh, Matt, I, I, we ask you to prepare some kind of a short like summary of what we know about exopla uh, rogue exoplanet and how we detect them. So you have the microphone. Okay, thank you, Frank. So um, assuming that you can see, oh no, I still haven't got Zoom down. Um, there we go, <laughs> uh, after over a year. So Exoplanets are usually detected by their own emitted light, or more commonly by their influence on the light emitted by the host star. But how do you detect a planet that emits no light of its own and does not orbit a star? This is the problem we face when trying to detect rogue planets. Our one saving grace is that rogue planets have mass, and that mass can affect the light of other stars. Um, the mass of a rogue planet causes a slight warp in the space-time around it. If a beam of light from a distant star passes close enough to the rogue planet, rather than traveling in a straight line, the light will take a very slightly curved path uh, around the planet. This slight bending of, uh, of the light's path can result in light rays that pass the planet on opposite sides, uh, eventually converging once they've passed the planet. If you observe the distant star when the rogue planet passes in front of it, both sets of converging light rays will converge upon you and you'll see, this dis and you'll see the distant star get momentarily brighter. This brightening is known, as uh, it is known as a gravitational microlensing event. The rogue planet has acted like a lens to brighten the background star. In order to see a microlensing event, you need to be positioned such that the rogue planet and the, and the background star align extremely precisely. And because the alignment must be so precise, the motions of the distant star, the rogue planet, and ourselves on Earth orbiting the sun transport us into and out of alignment very quickly. Uh, the alignment may only last a few hours for a rogue planet with the mass of, of the Earth. Uh, you can think of the microlensing event as a beam of light that sweeps across the Earth like a beam from a lighthouse. But unlike a lighthouse beam that regularly passes over us, we only get one chance to see the microlensing beam from a, from a rogue planet and gather all of the information that we can about it. We have no idea when a star will be microlensed and, and the degree of alignment needed is so precise that any given star may only be microlensed by a rogue planet once every few million years or so. 
In order to find rogue planets, the latest generation of microlensing surveys use dedicated telescopes with huge wide field, hundreds of megapixel cameras to monitor the stars in the densest regions of the Milky Way for microlensing events. These cameras allow surveys such as OGLE, KMTNet, MOA, WISE, and K2 uh, to monitor tens of millions of stars every 15 minutes to capture the short duration microlensing events caused by rogue planets. The surveys have now discovered at least 12 firm candidate rogue planets with a mix of likely masses ranging from Earth mass up through Jupiter mass. The light curves or plots of brightness versus time for three rogue planet microlensing candidates first found by the OGLE survey are shown here on the right. It's difficult to say more about the masses of individual rogue planets because the duration of the microlensing event is affected not just by the mass of a rogue planet, but also by uh, it and the background stars distances and speeds. By studying the distribution of rogue planet microlensing event durations though, uh, we can learn about the population of rogue planets and how their masses are distributed. Uh, it's also important to note that we can't say for certain that any individual rogue planet event is truly caused by a rogue planet and not just a planet a long way away from its star. But by searching for host stars after the events, we'll be able to say that most events are caused by rogue planets if we see no host stars. Uh, the search for rogue planets is challenging from the ground because their microlensing events have durations comparable to the length of the night. And even with networks of telescopes distributed over the globe, it's hard to catch all of an event. Looking to the future, in 2026, NASA will launch a Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, which will be only the second high resolution, wide field, hundreds of megapixel space telescope to be launched. It will have comparable resolution to the Hubble Space Telescope, but a field of view that's, uh, that's 100 times larger. Roman will search uh, for rogue planets by monitoring hundreds of millions of stars every 15 minutes for over a year in total. It will detect over a thousand cold exoplanets orbiting stars and likely hundreds of rogue planets, uh, some with masses of Mars or smaller. And that's not all. Um, if Roman teams up with the European Space Agency's Euclid telescope, the other high resolution wide field space telescope that should be launched next year, uh, there's slightly different locations in the solar system beyond the moon's orbit um, will mean that they pass through different parts of a rogue, pa rogue planet's microlensing beam and at slightly different times. This will allow us to untangle the effects of speed, distance, and mass of a rogue planet and get precise measurements of, the, of most of a rogue planet's masses that both telescopes see. Thank you, Matthew. So that's a very interesting introduction on the technology being used to detect those rogue exoplanets. But now uh, we invited Dorian to tell us a bit more about the potential for life or habitability on those exoplanets. And a crazy idea. Let's just say it, but let's go, go ahead, Dorian. Uh, let's go for it. Okay, so when we're searching for life on any sort of uh, non-Earth object, the thing that we usually start by searching for is water. And the reason is that water is essential for earth life. And if we're gonna look for other types of life, we have to start by looking for life that's at least as similar to earth life enough that we would even be able to recognize that it's life when we looked at it. So of course we could imagine types of life that don't require water, but the usual place we start is by looking for water as a proxy for habitability or a habitat where life could potentially take hold. And so basically this is a little diagram of NASA and their, their mantra in astrobiology is follow the water. So they're charging towards potential sources of water. And on the right, there's a diagram of water on earth. And what you can see here is that there's water in different types. So we can see liquid water, an ocean here. We can see solid water, the ice, which is floating on the ocean. So that's important for later. We can also see uh, water vapor, we can't see, but there's water vapor in the atmosphere and we can see clouds, condensed water vapor in the atmosphere. And all of those are going to come into this story. So we're going to be talking about a planet that's totally covered in ice, floating on top of the ocean, and its whole atmosphere has condensed out and is top, on top of the ice layer. So the way that I got stopped, started thinking about this, this is, we called our paper, the Steppenwolf paper. Uh, and the way that we got thinking about this was I had 
just heard of the habitable zone concept. So I had come from applied math and I was doing it on earth science problems. And then when I came to Chicago, someone explained me the habitable zone concept. And in physics, we like to do what's called asymptotics. So we take some theory or equation we're playing with and we push it as far as it can go and see what happens. So I was sort of, uh, you know, just chatting on the blackboard with one of my friends. And we said, what would happen if, if you just uh, took the habitable zone as far out as you could and took the planet all the way away from the star? Could you still stay habitable? So then we tried to think of a way that would work. And so the diagram here shows the traditional habitable zone on the, on the vertical axis is the temperature of the star. Lower down is sort of M stars, red stars. Higher up, we get into sun-like stars and even uh, higher temperature stars. And then the horizontal axis so, shows the illumination relative to Earth. 100% is Earth's level. And these are sort of various estimates of this habitable zone and planets that have been found. So we're not talking about these planets orbiting stars in the habitable zone. We're thinking, could you maintain liquid water or a type of habitability with no star at all? And this is the idea we came up with. And so Earth and other planets like Earth emit uh, energy from within. That's a combination of their formational energy, just the energy left over from things smashing together and the energy being released by radionuclides slowly. Both of those have a similar sort of a dissipa dissipation time scale, which is billions and billions of years. And so Earth is still spitting out energy from its formation and from these radionuclides with very long half-lives. And that heat flux on Earth is about 0.1 watts per meter squared, which compares to hundreds of watts per meter squared from the sun. So it's, it's much, much smaller. However, it's enough that if you have enough ocean or enough geothermal heat flux, you can keep water liquid underneath an insulating ice layer that acts as a blanket. So what you could imagine is a planet like Earth with an ocean on top of it, and then a thick layer of ice that insulates that ocean, and then the atmosphere frozen out that uh, adds further insulation. And... So it's sort of like if you have a K factor in your house uh, and it uh, for some insulating material, and if you just add enough insulating material, even just a small amount of heat flux can keep you warm in the house. So that, that's sort of the basic idea. And if you did this, according to our calculations, if you did this on earth, it just wouldn't work. So the ice would be frozen all the way to the bottom of the ocean but it's close. And so a planet with a little more water than Earth or a little bit higher heat flux could make this work if it were ejected. And so how would life exist underneath here? Most life on Earth ultimately gets its energy from the sun and that would be cut off. So you would have to make a living. The life would have to make a living off of chemical imbalances and materials being uh, brought up from the deep uh, interior of the planet. And so this, this, in addition to the geothermal heat flux, really requires a geologically active planet, something with something like plate tectonics still going or some sort of resurfacing. And so that's going to expire on a many billion year time scale. So this is a way that you could keep life potentially going on a rogue planet for billions of years, but not forever. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Dorian. So we're gonna do something special today. We're gonna ask uh, Lee to show um, a poll and ask questions first to our to our uh, viewers. Lee, can you show the poll, please? So are rock planets more likely to have our life than other exoplanets? So I will let you answer to this question based on what uh, Matthew and Dorian told us today. And, uh, and we will go back to this in a few minutes to see the result. So we have an idea of how convinced you are uh, by the existence of potential life on those, uh, on those rogue plan exoplanets. But before you show the result, Lee, let's, um, let's go for my first question, which is not really about science, but um, I think it's important we talk about the way we call those bodies. Uh, so first, first of all, we call them planets and uh, uh, we may want to <laughs> mention here that we should not be calling them planets, neither exoplanets, right? 
Matthew or Dorian, one of you want to take uh, talk about the, the naming of those bodies and why we call them rocks versus um, uh, wandering exoplanet or ejecting exoplanets. Matthew, you are you ready? I see you ready. <laughs> um, so I used to hate the name rogue planets. Um, I've I've finally acclimatized myself to it. Um, but astronomers tend to call them free floating planets rather than rogue planets. And neither is really a great name. Um, rogue sent, suggests some kind of moral <laughs> uh, significance to them, uh, which, which really shouldn't be placed on them, but it, it does sound cool. Um, free floating isn't really a great name either because, well, floating implies they're floating in something. Um, it, but it, it does at least, uh, evoke that they're, they're not bound to anything. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know where either name came from um, and neither's perfect, but. So in, in the paper I wrote on this, we called them Steppenwolf planets because they're like lone wolves roaming the galactic steppe. But okay. uh, w one interesting thing that happened after that paper was written, a philosopher of science. So I checked through some of the citations of it and a philosopher of science had written that he was basically talking about how scientists can't even be consistent about their own definitions. And he cited the IAU definition of planet and point one is attached to the sun uh, or attached to some star. And he said, look at these cuckoo guys who call this thing a planet and you know, it's not even attached to a star. So that's another funny sort of little layer <laughs> on there. Yeah, we're still arguing about the name for this uh, for these bodies. So we're gonna call them rogue planets, okay, for the for this talk. But uh, you, the, our viewers should know that there is a lot of different way of calling them. Uh, Lee, can you show the result of the poll, please? Okay, so we said that 80% 80, 80 of our viewers right now uh, believe that um, it's unlikely that those rock planets will have more life, um, are more likely to have life than uh, exoplanets, okay? So let's see if we can change this in the, in the, in the 30 minutes conversation we are going to have. So, um, Oh, so first of all, uh, Matthew, I have a very simple question for, for you. Could you tell us where those planets, those rogue exoplanets come from? What's the formation for the scenario here, the more likely? Yeah, so, so this is something that we want to find out. This is one of the reasons why we're, we're searching for them. But the, um, the, the main theory is that they start off being formed as regular planets belonging to a star. Uh, and then get ejected from those, their system somehow. Um, this could be in many possible ways, um, but primarily via gravitational interactions, probably with another planet in the system. Uh, and in that case, you'd probably need the other planet that stays in the system to be more massive than the planet that gets ejected. Um, but other ways that you might be able to form large numbers of rogue planets is in binary star systems. Um, at, planets seem to migrate uh, in the disk that they form and then they get brought closer to their stars. And if they form in a system of two binary stars at the center, um, that's kind of like a whisk going around at the center. And once they reach the inner edge of the disk, uh, the, the rogue planets might just get ejected once they're, they're too close to the stars. Um, they could also just form um, form by themselves uh, in a similar way to stars do. And there's certainly some indication that at least some very massive rogue planets form in this way uh, because they've been found in, in very young star clusters. Uh, and then I just want to mention one final thing. We don't, if all we measure is the mass, it's not necessarily, ne necessarily a planet that we're seeing. It might be something like a, a primordial black hole um, we, we might have no way to know the difference between the two. You open a Pandora box in the middle of this. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not go through that before <laughs> we take questions. <laughs> uh, Dorian, do you, you mentioned to me that um, those rogue exoplanets have been mentioned in the science fiction book, and that's kind of related to... Uh, can you tell us a bit in science, science sci-fi where we hear about them and what kind of rogue exoplanet we have? 
Yeah, so the first, I just uh, posted this story that a science fiction author named Ken Liu wrote after he read my paper 10 years ago. And the basic idea in that case was there was, it was a, a male and female planet. And this relates to what Matthew just talked about. So the male was a Jupiter sized planet and the female was an Earth sized planet. And she was starting to grow uh, life on herself. And the male planet uh, f felt attracted to her and tried to get too close and uh, gravitationally ejected her from the system. And then, you know, she iced over to protect her life and then wandered around uh, through space. So that, that's one story. And then the other one, I'm gonna send the wiki article on it is by someone called Fritz Lieber. It's about, uh, from 1951, it's a short story called A Pale of Air. And my understanding of the premise of this story, I haven't read it, is that earth is ejected and uh, people go underground and they live off nuclear energy, but they need to get air every so often in order to breathe. And the atmosphere has all uh, frozen out down onto the surface. So you just go upstairs with a bucket, pick up some atmosphere, and then put your bucket in your uh, nuclear heated house inside the ice layer and it uh, sublimates and you have air to breathe. Good, thank you. So we do know that uh, we have detected like a dozen of those uh, rogue exoplanets. And Matthew, this is a question for you. Uh, can we estimate how many there is in our galaxy based on that? And uh, maybe tell us a bit about um, the current technology that's being used. You may describe it by microgravitational lensing, but tell us about the telescope that's being used for this more specifically. Sure. So um, the the twelve exoplanet or twelve rogue exoplanets that have been uh, found by microlensing so far, those you could you could start to try to uh, estimate how many um, how many there are in the galaxy. I don't believe that there is a paper that has actually gone to the effort of doing that so far. It's it's quite a difficult calculation. Um, uh, and I'll go into uh, how we how we find them and what telescopes are used before coming back to that, uh, that question. So the telescopes that are used are kind of relatively small professional telescopes, one meter, two meter size telescopes, the biggest uh, uh, optical telescopes. And the biggest optical telescopes that are around today are 10 meters. Um, so they're, they're relatively small, but they have wide field cameras. So they're built up of multiple sen uh, digital camera sensor chips, um, tens to, I think 60 is maybe the largest uh, in use and maybe four is the smallest, uh, but with hundreds of uh, millions of pixels. And so by uh, with having such a large field of view, uh, the, the telescopes can look at the densest patches of sky, so those where there, there are most stars, and that, that's towards the center of the galaxy. Um, and you need to look there because mic microlensing events are so rare, uh, and then you, you also need to look through lots of space where you hope a rogue planet might be as well, so you want to look at distant star populations, so again, the center of the galaxy is great for that. Um, so then to find the microlensing event, you have to uh, see it uh, pass in front of a background star and cause it to get brighter. Uh, you have no idea that that might happen, so you just have to monitor lots and lots of stars and hope that they do. Um, and so you have to then uh, search through hundreds of millions, tens to hundreds of millions of stars, brightness versus time uh, graphs to, to look for the characteristic signature of a microlensing event. Uh, thankfully, they're, they're relatively unique. Um, so it's hard to confuse them with anything else that, that goes bump in the night. Um, but then once you've done that, to be able to understand how many, um, so that, that's how you, you go about searching for them and you can find some number that way, 12 so far. Um, but then to understand how many rogue planets there are in the galaxy, you need to understand how many you would have detected. Um, and that's not easy to do. You have to simulate lots of, um, lots of observations uh, by saying, in this star, if I put a rogue planet there uh, and 
caused a microlensing event due to it, would I have detected it? And um, the the efficiency for detecting them is still pretty low. Let's and excuse my cat sneezing. Um, uh, it's less than ten percent for for gram based surveys because you you can't look all the time. Uh, you have day and night cycles. You can only observe during the night. Um, weather bad weather happens, um, and then in the pandemic as well, that has has taken down some of the uh, the observatories because they they usually they usually have people there um, observing. It's not some aren't equipped for remote observations. So you have to basically simulate that a lot of times doing the experiment again and again in the computer to see how many you would have detected and knowing how many you would have detected, you can then infer how many there, there actually are. Okay, and so that's a difficult exercise. And uh, you mentioned that there is no studies yet which are very accurate to estimate the number of those. Yeah, the, the, planet. Um, the, the good candidates that have come about, the first one was discovered in 2017 and we're only up to 12 now in 2021. So it's, it, I, I'm sure that study is in the works. Uh, I'm not a member of what, uh, of any of the major teams that are, that are working on this, uh, the Ogle, uh, MOA and KMT net surveys, but um, I'm, I'm sure they're working on this. All right. So you detect, when we detect this tiny increase by 0.1 magnitude, we basically know the, the mass of the body, right? So That's, it's... Not it, it's not the increase in brightness that tells us uh, the mass, it's how long the event lasts. Um, and so, so in principle, microlensing can give you very, very high magnifications up to uh, thousands of times brighter if, uh, if the conditions are right. Usually it's a lot less than that. Um, but it's how long the event takes that tells you something about the mass of the, okay. of the planet. Um, so uh, the the angle by which the, the light gets bent is determined by the, the mass of the lens, uh, but also by the distance to from us to the, sorry, I said lens, I meant the planet, from us to the planet and from the planet to the, the background star that is getting brightened. Um, and then, so that, that determines the size of the lighthouse beam that's going to pass across us. Uh, but then the speed at which ev everyone's moving determines also impacts uh, the duration as well. So we don't get a very good idea of the mass of the, the planet. It's only, we can maybe tell the difference between a Jupiter-sized rogue planet and a Neptune-sized rogue planet if you just observe from the Earth. Um, but yeah, we don't get precise measurements. So Doyon, when I put this, what you, Matthew just told us in context, in 2011, when you wrote this paper on the proposal for, an habita for habitable planet in interstellar space, how many uh, uh, rogue exoplanets did we know? Like two? Yeah, less. I don't know. The, I mean, Matthew would be able to answer that number better. I, it was enough that I knew this was a possibility, but it was a lot less. And... Uh, they, they had these curves I remember looking at that showed the number of planets as a function of mass. And when you got to the lower masses, the uncertainties just blew up. And I don't know how much that's improved, but Matthew could talk about that. And lower masses means Earth-sized masses, by the way. Yeah. So you, um, you read this paper uh, to, to basically explain that it's possible to have uh, an ecosystem on those rogue exoplanets. So you describe some of the, the, you, in the model in your, in your presentation with the source of energy, which is underneath the surface and basically a thick layers to isolate the planet. How long the planet can be uh, cooled down? Let's, if you take Earth, you, ma you mentioned with Earth, the system was gonna cool down very fast. What should be the size of the planet for which we can and get a planet that will be insulated for, like, say, million of years. You have an idea? Can you give us an? Oh, so you, so the planet? time scale is billions of years. Uh, billions of years. It's billions of years. It it would be millions of years to form that ice layer, but then it you can keep the system going for billions of years. And it's kind of like it's like uh, the cold icy fingers of death 
just like closing around life's neck and squeezing and slowly, slowly the ice squeezes in until there's no ocean left. But that's a billions of year process. And that's the process of uh, the geophysical adjustment where the heat is lost from the system and eventually tectonics or other sort of resurfacing processes just shut down because the planet's dead. And so you go to more, a more Mars-like state where you're more geologically dead than an Earth-like state. And, uh, but the main reason that you couldn't get this to work on earth now is that the total amount of uh, geothermal heat flux is a little bit too low. Or another way to think about it is that the amount of ocean is a little bit too low. If we had, you know, three, I think it was three or four times as much ocean, you could get this to work on earth. But yeah, keep the time scale of billions of years in your mind for how long this could work. So, we mentioned that we described, we detected those by microlensing, but maybe one day we will be able to directly image them. What kind of information, Matthew, how are we going to do that, Matthew, first of all? And Dorian, what kind of information you would like to, to see to, uh, to, to find out that there is life on one of those rogue exoplanets? This is very speculative, but I really wanted to ask you to, you to this question. So I'm, go I'm going to be a huge pessimist here and say I, I, I don't think that it would be possible. So you're not going to get any, uh, you're going to get very little light from, uh, from these uh, rogue planets. So they're, they're going to be very cold, roughly ice temperatures um, at the surface. So they, they will be glowing in thermal, energy, uh, thermal radiation, um, just like anything with uh, with any kind of heat does, um, but the the levels will be will be extremely extremely low. Um, then, at least for the ones that we find via microlensing, those are going to be a very long way away from uh, from Earth. You would need maybe if something was in the in the very near solar neighborhood, you might have a chance of imaging it in very long wavelength infrared, but. Um, I'm going to be a pessimist and say, I, I doubt there's a way to do it. Yeah, so we went through this game. We played that game and did a calculation of how you could image it in the paper. And uh, it's really, really cold. So, you know, like the, the emission temperature of these things, if you do sigma t to the fourth equals 0.1 watts per meter squared, you get like 35 Kelvin. So it's not emitting a whole lot of uh, infrared. But we calculated that if such a planet passed within thousands of astronomical units of Earth, then you could detect it with reflected light or uh, thermal emission. So it's got to be really close, really, really close. And then you could do it. Whether you could detect life on it, I think that's pretty hopeless. Uh, so, I mean, there might be life on Europa and Enceladus, and we're right next to them, and we can look at what's coming out of them and we still can't tell for sure so far if there's life there or not. And so now we're talking about something way further away. It seems pretty hard to imagine unless you, unless it came close and you sent a probe there. Okay. So you, um, you think that uh, we are not going to be able to imagine one of these world if it's come, if it's not coming close to us. So Matthew, we are going to have a, spa a spacecraft, the W first and, uh, and Euclid, who's going to be searching for those uh, rogue exoplanets. So what's the scientific goal of this research if we is not to characterize them? Right. So I mentioned that you only get one chance to make any kind of measurement on these, and um, that that literally is all you get. So uh, you see uh, you see this uh, change in brightness uh, over the course of a, an hour, a few hours or so. Um, so with with just one spacecraft, with just the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, what uh, Frank called uh, W first, the, the previous name for it. Um, Sorry. you, you can get a rough measurement of any individual plant, uh, rogue planets mass. Um, and so that in itself is not super interesting. You, you don't necessarily know that it's even a rogue planet and you, you only get a very rough estimate of its mass. Um, but when you gather hundreds of these, uh, you can start to look at the distribution of their masses 
Um, so whether there's more Jupiter-sized uh, rogue planets than Earth-sized or any different uh, distribution. And that can potentially tell you interesting things about how they were ejected from their star systems. Uh, if, you need, um, if you need a higher mass object to eject a planet, um, and then we don't see high mass, a large number of high mass planets in star systems via regular exoplanet search techniques, that suggests that they might be formed in a different way, maybe through this binary, um, binary star formation channel, something like that. Um, so it's all kind of a, it's a statistical game where you're trying to study the, the entire population. Um, and I mentioned that if you if you observe a two space telescope, so you can do this from space and the Earth as well. It's just a little harder because it's hard to do from the Earth. Um, you can you can get better estimates of the masses and get a higher resolution picture of the of the distributions. Nice. So the Doyon probably maybe you want you can tell us a bit about after the publication of this paper. I didn't look at how often it's been seeded, but do you know if, they, if you have kind of created a community of people more interesting in the in this potential life on rock exoplanet? Is there anything that came out recently from uh, models that uh, interested you on this uh, question? Yeah, well, I mean, it's important to s just to know that it, like everything else in science, this wasn't the first time anyone had ever thought of this. And so there were a couple of previous papers, uh, one by Laughlin and Adams, where they had investigated a similar idea, and one by Stevenson at Caltech. Stevenson's idea was actually a planet closer to, uh, with a huge hydrogen envelope. And so the blanket would just be a uh, hydrogen greenhouse effect. And so those were the other ideas that people had thought about. But I think, uh, you know, the paper is cited some and it's it sort of thought of as, I would say, like an interesting curiosity. Like, you know, there's it, something interesting to think about. If, if you could have life in these type of environments, then there just must truly be life everywhere. Uh, but it's, it's not, and I don't think it was ever really intended to be the sort of thing that's going to be the dominant area of research for people interested in planetary habitability. And the most important reason for that is that, uh, as Matthew has been saying, it's hard to follow up. And so you want to have some interplay between observations and theory if you're going to make progress. And this is a problem where it's a lot harder to do that. Yeah. Progress with the magnitude, but I want to go back to the poll. Can we ask the same question again? Feel free to answer the question again, so we see the change. If you change the 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 view, uh, and uh, Simon, if they're ready, if we have questions from the audience as well. Okay, hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, Rebecca and I have been gathering um, the multitude of questions, almost as many questions as there probably are rogue planets out in the galaxy. So um, uh, Rebecca, did you want to kick things off? Happy to, hold on. So the first question um, is a very basic question. It's something you guys have been talking about and you've touched on it. But um, what is microlensing? If you could talk about that a little bit, just a simple explanation. But also, um, can microlensing detect anything other than mass? And could it detect a rogue planet headed towards our solar system? That's a that's a lot of questions. So I'll try and <laughs> I'll try and answer them one by one. And if I miss one, please remind me. Um, so, uh, microlensing is an effect, so it was predicted by uh, Albert Einstein, it, it's, it results from general relativity, um, but you don't need to uh, understand the, the complexities of that theory to, to understand what's going on. Um, just like masses attract each other uh, via gravity and hold, so 
gravity holds planets in place uh, and causes planets to orbit around stars. Um, light, which is moving a lot, lot faster than a typical planet in a solar system is, uh, will also be affected by the gravity of um, another massive object. Um, and so that means that rather than traveling in a straight line, as we usually think of light doing, um, it actually travels in a, will travel in a slightly curved path around a, a massive object. Uh, and so you can, if you, if you have a massive enough object and um, light that's traveling close enough to it, it will be bent around and you can imagine the, the scenario where you have a, a distant background star uh, light from that travels past a rogue planet um, and then gets bent slightly by the rogue planet and light can pass on both sides of it and get bent back towards um, the, the line connecting uh, the, the distant star, the rogue planet. And then if we place ourselves in on that line as well, we'll see more light from the background star than we would have if, uh, if the rogue planet hadn't been there. And so this is uh, this is what a microlensing event is. It's we're, we're close enough to that line of sight to uh, to see a, a change in brightness of the background star. Uh, and now I've I have forgotten the other two questions. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, uh, can a, uh, what can a microlensing event detect besides mass? Right. And the second part is could it detect a rogue planet heading towards our solar system? Yeah, so, um, so we can detect any massive object with microlensing so long as it happens to pass in front of uh, a background star. Uh, and so most microlensing events are caused by other stars. Um, and if those other stars have planets around them, then we can also see, uh, see the planets. Um, they, they have a really in, uh, interesting and uh, dramatic change in brightness um, for background stars when you have a planetary system or say a binary star or something like that. Um, and so, so long as the object has maps, it could be anything. It could be a star, a planet, um, a, uh, a black hole. All of those can be, be found via microlensing. There, there is a maximum limit if the, or a minimum limit on the, uh, the size of object you can see if say you had an asteroid that might not have enough mass to bend the light by enough as it passes the edge of the object to be able to see it. So there you would just see um, a, a loss of light as the object passes in front rather than a gain in light um, as light gets bent around it. Um, and then the final question was um, about whether we could see a rogue planet headed towards us. Um, Probably not. So that's the worst case for microlensing. Uh, you need the object to be passing, traveling in the direction opposite to uh, in the plane of the sky to be able to see the microlensing event come and go. Um, so if it was traveling directly towards us, then uh, then we wouldn't really notice it. It would just be constantly magnifying um, the background star. Of course, everything's moving, so that situation never happens. But um, yeah, that's the, that's the worst case scenario. Okay, talk, talking of worst case scenarios, which is the next question. Um, uh, first of all, a, a practical case. What is what is the closest uh, rogue planet that has been discovered? Um, and is there a limit on how close you know you can discover? And and talking of, of rogue planets heading our direction, of course, we had a mua mua uh, that that was brought up in the chat as well, passing through, which is certainly not a planet um, and far too small to 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 feature in this sort of uh, uh, process. But uh, what are the hazards? Space is big, but, but you know, the sun is a big gravitational well. So Dorian, you probably have a better idea of what the likelihood of one passing uh, close enough to detect is. So do you want to take that to start with? I, I don't think you should be staying awake worried about this. <laughs> on the list, the list of things to worry about, I don't think it's very high. Uh, but that's that I don't have uh, right now a better estimate for you than that. But uh, yeah, I, I, we were not optimistic that one was going to pass within 1000 AUs. 
Yeah, and I'll I'll just say for the 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 ones that we've found via microlensing so far, we have no idea what their distances are. Um, it could be anywhere along the line of sight between us and the the background star. Um, most of them are probably quite a long way into the galaxy. So um, the the center of the galaxy is about eight uh, twenty six thousand uh, light years away. Most of these are going to be thousands of light years away. Um, the ones that were discovered in young clusters, those are closer, um, but my opinion is they're, they're failed stars, not rogue planets. I guess the only thing you could say is if you were in a star formation cluster and you had a lot of stars next to each other and they're in their formation period and the giant planets are moving around and getting kicking each other into eccentric orbits and spitting out terrestrial planets everywhere, you would have a much higher chance of a planet from a different system coming into your system. But uh, I can't put any quantitative figures on that immediately. Okay. Uh, we may have a problem with Frank. He, he said he got kicked out, but we've got some more questions. So hopefully he'll come back in shortly. Um, and the next question is, uh, is also kind of a two-parter. Uh, what's the difference between a rogue planet and a brown dwarf? And can rogue planets have moons? Okay, well, uh, I can answer the second one. Uh, yeah, if Earth were ejected, it would have a moon. So sure. Uh, and then the difference between a brown dwarf and a planet uh, is a little bit fuzzy in terms of people, you know, people argue about that, but most people would say it's whether you had some uh, thermonuclear reactions at some point in the history. Yeah, wait a second. Am I right about that? Matt? Why don't you answer that? I'll probably mess it up. Yeah. Um, no, that, I think that's the right answer. So um... There's a there's a dividing line between a star and a brown dwarf, and that's whether the uh, the object starts burning regular hydrogen. And then there's a more fuzzy, more, more arguable about um, line between a brown dwarf and a planet, and that's whether it starts burning uh, deuterium, which is a an isotope of hydrogen. Um, so that's that's a usual dividing line, um, at least for for the techniques that um, like radial velocities where you measure, uh, you get some estimate of the mass of the object. Um, you could argue that that uh, definition isn't really that useful. <laughs> um, it might be might be better to d define a planet versus a brown dwarf versus a star based on how they form. I personally prefer that way of thinking about it, but then you have no way of, if you, an isolated object, you have no way of knowing. So it, it's not that useful, but it, it's more of a theorist definition, I would say. And about the moon, the real question is, could you have a moon moon of a rogue planet? So could you have a rogue planet with a moon and then a moon of the moon? That would be really <laughs> exciting. Yeah, my, my understanding of that is that um, most moons are pretty deep in the gravitational well of their own planets. So if, if the planet gets ejected, it will stick with the planet, but probably in a more eccentric, more exciting orbit, which would raise tides and heat the, heat the planet. Yeah, that's good for keeping it, you know, longer term heat flux. Mm -hmm. Is it, we've been talking about um, rogue planets as, as, as solar systems flying apart. Is this, is this a possibility of building a solar system? Um, you know, a, a star capturing a planet in a productive way. Uh, and if so, maybe how could you tell um, that a particular planet is not native to that solar system? The dynamics might be a bit weird, but uh, uh, is this possible? So I'm vaguely aware, I don't know the full details on this, but I believe that one of the planets that was discovered around a pulsar in a globular cluster is theorized to have arrived around the pulsar by exchange from another planetary system in the cluster. Um, I think for the techniques that we have now, we probably don't have a great way of telling whether this planet formed in the system or not. Um, 
most of the time, I would say the probabilities are so, so low, but uh, anything being captured, like the, the velocity is between a planet that's ejected and another star is going to be too high for, for capture in most cases. But maybe in the in globular clusters, you have the just the right conditions to, to allow it. I just thought of something else that people might be interested in, which is tangentially related. But over the next 5 billion years, there's a 1% chance that our system will actually become uh, chaotic and Mercury's orbit will be destabilized. It's probably not going to become a rogue planet uh, because it's too close to the sun to escape, but it could uh, smash into the sun or, or hit another planet. And I recently did calculations that there's a one in 10,000 chance that will happen over the next 2 billion years. So I'll, I'll put that in the chat in case you're. Yikes. Uh, so I see Frank is back, but we've still got some more questions. So tell us when we should stop. Um, so a planet, if a planet, would a planet be subjected to strong tidal effects if it was ejected from its, its solar system? And what impacts could that have on any life on that planet? I don't think it would impact the life on the planet if there was life on the planet already. Uh, I guess the, the idea is it passes so close to another planet or the star that it gets a really strong tidal effect. But it would just be temporary. It, it would just happen once, I think. I, I don't know. I, I don't think so, but I don't know for sure. What do you think, Matthew? Yeah, I, I don't have a good answer other than, yeah, if, if you had a close approach, like we feel the tides from the moon and the sun. And if you got close to the sun, you'd have a larger tidal effect. Uh, and if we, if you were ejected via a close approach to something like Jupiter, you'd have a reasonably large, large compared to what we currently experience here on Earth. Um, but yeah, it would be a one-time thing. So maybe you'd get a bunch of earthquakes, something like that. But I, um, I would imagine most ejections, it, it probably wouldn't affect life too much. You could have, um, so one of the possible outcomes of all this gravitational dynamics is, is that you get complete tidal disruption of a planet. So um, uh, if, uh, if, it's, if it's not dense enough, I think you can uh, rip a, maybe something like a low density gas giant apart. Um, but I think most of the outcomes that would or something like that often just end in the planet hitting the star. I'm not super familiar with um, the, the kind of dynamical simulations that you get you that so, so Dorian might be able to correct me. Yeah, well, if we're narrowly considering this question from the perspective of life, being ejected from the system is a more dangerous prospect than the tidal forces you would experience during the ejection, I think. Talking of science fiction, I remember that um, there was a, a show called Space 1999 that was made back in the 70s where the Earth's moon was ejected from, from the solar system actually due to uh, nuclear waste dump exploding, which is completely impractical. But but that, that was, <laughs> the moon became a rogue planet. If you, if you want to find the episodes of that on YouTube, they're quite cringingly old fashioned, but great fun. Um, how This is question is sort of related to the last one in the, uh, um, in the sense of ejection, how, how fast, what is the velocity typically of, of these uh, uh, planets as they move through the galaxy? Um, uh, they must be ejected reasonably quickly to escape their parent star. Um, so the, as far as I understand the typical velocity that something's ejected at is roughly the escape velocity um, at, of the star at the position of the planet. And that's actually relatively low. Um, it's, it's small compared to the velocities between stars. Um, so when, when I simulate uh, what future uh, missions will, will be able to find in terms of rogue planets, I just assume that the, the rogue planets are moving at the same speed as uh, the, the population of stars. 
Yeah, I just looked that up. The escape velocity of the sun is 615 kilometers per second. But it's important to remember when we're talking about velocities that it depends on your reference frame. So. Yeah, when I say escape velocity, I mean the velocity to escape from an orbit. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. For that velocity. But the other velocities of stars moving relative <laughs> to each other, it depends on which star your reference frame is based in. Yeah. Yeah. So the relative velocities between stars are kind of tens of kilometers per second uh, in the solar neighborhood. And then as you get into the center of the galaxy, it goes up to 100, roughly 100 or 200 kilometers per second. Um, so planets would be going at maybe a few kilometers per second as they get ejected. Okay. All right. Is it okay if we do two more questions? One more question? Yeah, we can do two more questions. Two more Go questions. Ahead. Okay. So this is the second to last question, um, which is, are rogue planets more likely to be formed closer to the galactic center in the gravitational hurly-burly at the center of the galaxy? Um, and so are they radiating from the galactic center? I guess I, I, my uh, naive assumption would be that their formation would be correlated with the number of stars, uh, the density of stars, and they're more dense at the center, I think. So I guess I would agree with that uh, analysis. So yeah, in, in terms of absolute number, there are a lot more stars close to the center of the galaxy, so you would have more of them there. Um, but in terms of whether the, the, the increased density of stars at the center of a galaxy would have a big impact on their production? I don't think so. Um, the, like, the, the distance between typical stellar encounters is, um, is usually very large, even in relatively dense systems. In, um, so like the center of a galaxy, the most dense systems are globular clusters. There, it, it, I believe the, the theoretical calculations and simulations do suggest that it could Im increase the rate of rogue planet production. Yeah, because just to follow up on that, the usual formation mechanism is uh, other planets in the system moving around and ejecting. It's not a nearby star passing and leading to an ejection. Uh, that maybe leads on to, to the, fi the final question, which is about the, the, the stage in the evolution of a, of a planetary system that this is most likely to happen. Are these very, probably very young planets that are, that are being shot out simply because the, the planetary system is, is in the process of formation? Or as you say, a Dorian, you know, Mercury could, could one day sort of suffer the same fate. So, so this is mature systems that also uh, contribute. Well, I guess I think most people would assume it's uh, more likely in an earlier system. And I think the reason is if a system's lasted for a billion years, it's less likely to have a major adjustment that throws something out. Uh, whereas early systems, when they're just forming, they could easily be in a configuration where they're only stable for 10 million years, and then things get moved around and thrown out. The other thing, if you talk to the people who think about the Earth, the solar system's formation, they think that uh, Saturn and Jupiter moved around a lot early on. And that was associated with when there was a planetary disk and those disks dissipate. And so that's another argument that you might think this would happen early. Uh, although you can't rule out it happening later. But what do you think, Matthew? Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I've been, so I worked with uh, Elisa Quintana on a, a, a prediction of how many you'd get, how many rogue planets you, terrestrial mass rogue planets you'd get from a, a system that looked just like um, the solar system. And the, uh, most of the ejections happened relatively early. Um, although, as Dorian said, planetary systems are chaotic and you can have large changes in uh, the results after any amount of time just you're more likely to get them early than you are later. But there's always a possibility that uh, something could go wrong. OK. I think we are, we're done, Simon, with the questions. Yeah? OK. So I'm sorry, I had some issue with my internet connection. So I hope you can hear me well. Um, 
Yeah, thank you for these very interesting questions. We uh, and you answered Dorian and, and Matthew. Uh, I have one final one, which is uh, more about you, uh, your professional life and the future. So, what do you expect? What's exciting you the most in the field of uh, rogue exoplanet in the upcoming five, ten years, and to which you think you are going to be involved? What project? What uh, ideas? What discoveries? Dorian, you want to start? Yeah, I can start, but this is, you're going to get a more exciting answer from Matthew. Uh, so I tend to sort of jump around on different things. Uh, I'm a theorist and you, you can do that more in theory. And right now I'm really excited about, I posted that little uh, paper about making calculations. So in that paper, we developed a technique to uh, calculate really rare events in planetary dynamics numerically efficiently. Events that if we just ran the model forward, it would take a hundred years to get the calculation, but we can, uh, we can do a special splitting scheme on our simulations to use the same amount of numerical effort and get a hundred times rarer event. And so that's what I'm excited about right now. And the sorts of questions we could ask is suppose a new asteroid is discovered near earth, we can get a really accurate probability that it will hit earth. Or uh, mm -hmm. suppose some exoplanets are discovered and we're trying to figure out uh, whether they could be in a stable configuration. We could use techniques like this to find stable configurations quickly. So that, that's what I'm excited about. Okay, what about you, Matthew? That is exciting. Um, yeah, I'm, so I've spent most of my career working on missions that would happen in the future. And so I've been working on uh, Roman for nearly 10 years now and, and similarly uh, plans for trying to do microlensing of Euclid for even longer than that. Um, so I'm I'm excited by the imminent launch dates and being actually being able to see the telescopes actually take shape. So um, actually seeing a mirror and different components of the hardware, actually seeing data from um, from the detectors that will go into the into the missions. So it's a really exciting time to to be working on this. Um, still not as exciting as it will be when they actually launch and we can actually look at the data. Um, but the 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 kind of tantalizing glimpses we're getting of this population from from the ground-based surveys. I I was I've been blown away by how many um, candidates they've found in the in the last few years, and so we we just expect to multiply that when when we get into space to do this. Okay, so I would like to see the result of the last poll uh, <laughs> because I don't think we see. Well, it didn't change. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we don't have a bars on that, but it didn't change. We still did not convince people that rogue exoplanets are more likely to have more life than other exoplanets. But you know, that's uh, that's what science is all about. Um, you I'm are there's twenty percent that do believe that it's more yeah, life. there is twenty percent, and that's a, that's a good number. You are both like uh, exploring the the last frontier, and I would say, of the search for exoplanets, because that, those are really the truly difficult search and characterization. As you say, as you mentioned uh, to me, Matthew, it's still amazing anyway that we can detect planets that don't emit light, that they are invisible almost to us, and we still can detect them and get some numbers about the frequency in the future in our Milky Way. So we will see, maybe um, the future will show that uh, there is a lot of exoplanets like super Earths, which are free floating in our galaxy. And maybe those could be the places where we will find life one day. And thank you very much to both of you, Matthew and Dorian, and Simon will take over. Yes, um, on behalf of Bill Diamond, who had to leave early, um, thank you everyone for joining us today. We, uh, I have a list of, of where people were, were tuning in from, and it, it's far too long. We will uh, be bedtime by the time we get through it, but uh, many, many states around the US and, and many countries, India, Italy, Denmark, Netherlands, Canada, Wales, Bolivia, Tunisia, I have to list them all now, Norway, Sweden, Germany, the UK, Thailand, Brazil, Spain, Greece, Philippines, Nigeria, and Armenia. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, thanks to our guest speakers, uh, Dorian and Matthew, and to Frank for his moderation, and all of you for your great questions. Um, also, I'd like to thank uh, Rebecca, Lee, 
Beth and Jasmine and uh, the rest of the team um, at the SETI Institute who make the SETI Talk series possible. Don't forget to visit our YouTube channel and tour the amazing array of lectures, presentations, and other videos. Uh, this will also be posted on our YouTube channel um, should you uh, uh, have missed the beginning or want to watch it again. Um, I guess today we'll be receiving a mission patch from the SETI Talks series and the highly coveted SETI Talks mug, which um, I actually have one in front of me. Um, these will be winging their way to you. Um, very, very exciting. and. Uh, uh, almost as, as precious as, as Oscars. Um, in closing, we'd like to remind you that the SETI Institute is a nonprofit research education outreach organization that's supported in part by donations from the public, from people like you. Uh, we bring these lectures and other events to you at no cost, but we're very grateful for any and all donations um, that allow us to continue bringing the stories of extraordinary science to you. Uh, we invite you to join our quest and become part of our community. Please visit SETI.org for more information. Um, please make a donation if you can and definitely sign up for our monthly newsletter uh, called Journey and you can find out more details about that on our website. If you're interested in sponsoring a SETI Talks event, please contact us to learn more and the email for that is info at SETI.org. So finally, thank you again everyone and we look forward to seeing you next month for the next SETI Talks. Back to you, Frank. Bye-bye, Matthew. Bye, Dorian. Thank Thanks. you. Bye.